did this ourselves. They're coming. It can't be. Where is everyone? Hello, survivors, and welcome to the Apocalypse Postcast. It's a podcast. I'm your host, Makeshift, and we're back with another round of Wastelander stories, with three all-new guests here to tell their tales. Coming up are stories of vermin infestations, some mistimed theatrics, and a lesson on how to get a contract signed at gunpoint. My first guest is a fairly new Wastelander who's made her presence known at the event and online in Wastelander forums. She's the leader of the cult of cat meat and guardian of the one true Lard Al Miauti. She is the High Hierophant Grotch. Say hello, Grotch. Hello. You've been hosting weekly live online games of Cards Against Wastelanders, which are a ton of fun. Where can people tune in to play? We do those from the uh, Cat Meat page on Facebook. Uh, we do them every Thursday. They start usually around 8 o'clock. Sometimes the time will vary, but we do them once every other week. And they're a ton of fun. You guys listening should definitely tune in. And you've also formed a nonprofit to help Wastelanders fur babies. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, the charity that we have started is MEOWS, which is an acronym for uh, Medical Emergencies of Wasteland Sidekicks. And basically what we do is we collect money through various means, mostly through selling cat meat related swag. We've got t-shirts, buttons, stickers, necklaces. And then we also have some of our tribe's finer publications like the Cat's Paws. Um, and we also have a calendar that we just made. But all of that money goes towards uh, helping Wastelanders pay for unexpected vet bills. If your dog gets hit by a car, give us a call. If your cat starts throwing up all over the place, give us a call and we'll do what we can to help you out. That's so cool. And I know that calendar is pretty saucy. Oh, yeah. It's a, have it's had rave reviews for sure. I think it came out great. <laughs> yeah, we did that with the Dukes of the Nuke as well with the Dukes After Dark calendar. We have another one coming up, so thanks for raising the bar for for us with some of those poses. Well, it's funny because my friend Beef hit me up and he's like, hey, I'm just getting into photography. I want to, you know, shoot a calendar. But he hit me up on like December 13th. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. Like, fuck it. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Somehow managed to pull it off. So, so good. I'm so glad you guys are helping out the Wastelander community like that. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Awesome. Okay, next up, he's the Scourge of the Shadow Hills, the Doolahand and Arc Arsonist of the Harbor Territory, as well as the Captain of the Petro Pirates. Welcome to the show, Sharky, who sporadically goes by Corvus. Ahoy and avast. How goes? (laughs) Not too bad, and thanks so much for coming on. Now, were you guys the first ones to bring a pool table to the Wastes? To the best of my knowledge, we were the first ones to bring a full-size pool table to the Wastes. Simultaneously... Actually, not simultaneously. The next year, there was somebody who brought a full-size snooker table, which is slightly smaller to the waist. What's snooker? Snooker is a more of a UK popular version of pool. It used to be popular here in the States, but it's no longer as nearly as much. So, Fantastic. Well, I know it's been a hit, and I guess it's something you have to bring if you're going to have a pool hall. So, well done. I don't know how you guys pull it off. but <laughs> I mean, I really enjoy pool, so I'm bringing it for myself. If anyone else if they want to play, they're welcome to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if I remember right, your pool table is actually pretty well balanced for something you're picking up and throwing in the back of a truck a few times a year. Correct. Yes, it's it's properly leveled and properly, you know, properly adjusted so that it's as as fair as Wasteland can expect. Fantastic. And what would you say your record is in Wasteland pool games? Do you win? Do you lose? What's going on? Well, I'm going to brag, but I am yet undefeated. <laughs> really? Well, I think that's a challenge, Wastelanders. Definitely a challenge. Yeah. Um, when someone's coming after your bounty, do they have to beat you in a pool game, or is it just like the regular rock, paper, scissors? They have to beat me in two out of three tasks. What are those tasks? Uh, it depends on that person's comfort level. Typically, I assign it so that they pick one, I pick one, and then we both agree on a third one. Oh, cool. What's been your best challenge yet? Like, what's been the most fun? Uh, pool is usually the one we both agree to because they're fools and they don't know how good I am at it. Uh, <laughs> I knew it. The one, the one that, uh, that I, I uh, usually win at is longshoreman or AKA the rope game, which some other people I'll elaborate on later also play the same game, but, uh, I won't go into the de- 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 details of it. If you want to find it, come find me. <laughs> That's great. Sharky. And our third and final guest you may know as the overseer of Vault 154, the production manager of Wasteland Weekend, Dominar of the Attack Squad tribe, fearless leader of post apoc rock band Attack. He is the False Prophet. Hey, but there are some who call me Tim. 
Nailed it. <laughs> uh, hey, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Now, your band, Attack, just released your first full-length album called Antagonist, which is so absolutely kick-ass. Everyone needs to check out this album. Where's the best place to find it? Uh, yeah, dude, thank you so much. Uh, man, it's available everywhere music is sold. iTunes, uh, I think that's Apple Music now, right? Um, Spotify, Pandora, mp3.com surprisingly enough napster is still a thing e-music amazon music it's on everything so we have it uh globally distributed to like i think 400 different places wow impressive yeah <laughs> yeah that is so great and seriously this is some of your best music i mean you guys have been putting out awesome music for as long as i've known you and at times your music can be like uh, a little bit funny you can do some covers that are just absolutely amazing and unexpected. Tons of fun. <laughs> covers. But this album, you put your heart and soul into this one. Like these lyrics are just on a different planet. Oh, thanks, man. It was uh, uh, definitely a rough patch for sure. Uh, like physically, mentally, emotionally. Right. Um, and then um, the album was it, it was this big fight. Am I going to keep? writing songs about nuclear apocalypse and fighting zombies and wasteland and stuff like that, which the answer is always yes. But you know, also I had these other tracks that have been piling up for a few years and I was like, let's kind of get this out. It, it was definitely a cathartic experience, not as cathartic as like cutting my dreadlocks off, but definitely like it was awesome. It was good to finally get some of these stories out. Fantastic. All right, guys. Well, thank you all for coming on the show. It's an honor to be talking to all of you. Absolutely. Likewise. So let's get into the stories because uh, I'm super excited. You have some awesome stories to tell today. And first up is going to be Grotch. And she's going to tell us a story about how her tribe found themselves overrun by rodents, all from behind enemy felines. Enemy felines. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yes. <laughs> so she's going to spin a cattail. But that's coming up right after a message from the Petro Pirates, improvised right now by Corvus. Hi there. Have you ever wanted to sail the black? Do you dream of oodles and oodles of treasure and precious gems? Do you want to live on an island in the middle of a toxic soup and eat up mutant fish? Do you want to be constantly harassed on all sides by enemies and take their things? Join the Petro Pirates. Sail beneath the black. <laughs> I love it. Okay, Grotch, tell us your story. All right, so a little bit of context. Uh, the tribe that I run is the Cult of Catmeat, and we are basically a cat-themed tribe where we worship a black cat that I found actually in the wastelands on my very first year of Wasteland, which was 2017. And it's kind of just created a mind of its own and gone off on the off the rails and done its own thing. One of our other tribes that we're allied with is the Raging Ferals, and they are a biker tribe. They run uh, guns, they run people, they run money, they do all the things that you would expect a biker tribe to do. Um, I don't know what position he is. I think he's the VP, but his name is Hydro, and me and him have always kind of butted heads because he worships some other false deity something to do with water or some nonsense with that <laughs> so, <laughs> um one day uh, i think it was friday we have our little cat meat shrine set up and i walk past it and i see this little rubber mouse on the floor and i'm like hmm that's that's cute someone someone brought a little snack for the lard all right so go about my business and then i walk past the shrine again and there's another mouse and i'm like hmm an original, but okay, let's, 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 let's go with it. Cool. Let's another snack. Great. So <laughs> <laughs> every time I walk by this fucking shrine, like there's another mouse in front of it. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? I know there's no way that these mice are breeding because they're little rubber mice. Um, but <laughs> as, it, as it turns out, like after 30 or 40 of them, a rumor reaches me where someone has sent people on a quest to bomb our church with, fucking these little teeny rubber mice and by the end of the weekend we had about 70 of them oh my, my god yeah, like people were just like throwing them into the graveyard like people were like throwing the like the quest was to get them inside but i guess people got lazy about it and just started like throwing them at the front of our building which i thought was <laughs> hilarious my my 
my door person was so mad. She spent like 40 minutes picking up mice on the day that we like packed out. <laughs> she was like, there's so many fucking mice. Where did these all come from? <laughs> Wait, what did you guys do to deserve getting bombarded with all these rodents? Well, Hydra likes to pretend like his water goddess or whatever she is, is like the deity that he really worships. But clearly he worships cat meat if he's going to throw all these offerings our way. Like, let's be real. <laughs> That's hilarious. So now cat meat does not actually go to the festival. So there was no cat to be eating up all these mice. No, that means does not come to the event because I want him to be safe and happy. And uh, that is no place for animals, in my opinion. Yeah. And um, are there any plans for retribution? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm probably going to keep some of the mice and, like, sew them onto, like, various costume parts. I, I did a photo shoot for the calendar, and there's actually, like, if you look really close, there's all the rubber mice scattered at my feet. <laughs> oh wow, I didn't notice that. I'll have to take another look. Yeah, they're all they're all scattered at my feet. Um but we we do have plans for those uh rubber mice and I don't want to give too much away, but it was definitely going to involve a quest line uh for the next wasteland. Oh, fantastic. See, now this is one of those perfect pranks. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. But it's impactless victimless prank that you can pull at a festival like this where you're not stealing anything, you're not damaging anything, and you're leaving these breadcrumbs for someone to figure out what the heck is going on. So it actually creates a bit of a mystery you can go ahead and solve. Yeah, I thought it was a brilliant prank. Like that year was the year of the pranks and there are so many. Like, that was the year of the meme wars and the meme wars bled over into real life and it made me so fucking happy. I was loving it. I was living for it. Oh my gosh. The meme wars were just so fun. Oh. It was just one tribe bashing another tribe. I got in on it on the Apocalypse Post just for fun. It's so funny because you do it with love. You know, you don't prank people you don't really like. So you're pranking your friends mostly. <laughs> and with that, let's go on to Corvus's story. So the lore of Wasteland City, along with its tribal mechanics, have been being built for over a decade now. And sometimes new tribes have to learn the hard way how to coexist in Wasteland City. Here's Corvus to tell you about one time they brought in the big guns to help close a deal, and along the way showed everyone a good time. Right after a quick ad improvised right now by the False Prophet. Oh, shit. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, oh, man. I was like, oh, man, it's going to be great. No, shit. Okay. Um, <laughs> You're doing great already. Halfway through my, my sip of my gin and tonic, because I thought this was going to be a video. <laughs> Try gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Greetings, Wastelanders. Would you like to join a cult that doesn't involve water or animals? Come to the Black Church, where the attack squad lives. Um, on Sundays, we do uh, punch. Uh, it's, the, it's the Kool-Aid hour. Um, it's alcoholic. It'll fucking kill you, but not not really. It'll ruin your day. Uh, <laughs> also home to uh, Attack, the Wasteland's most talentless shit band, as left by a reviewer on the internet many years ago. Uh, Yay, uh, one also, star. <laughs> yeah, one star. Uh, also, uh, Vice called us uh, astonishingly bad metalcore, which I would have to agree, because we don't play metalcore. So... Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> come by the Black Church. Uh, the false prophet. Um, next year, we're going to have the tabernacle. It's going to be a bar. It, it's going to be rad. Oh, man. I, I was so ready for this like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> that was absolutely gold. Yeah, that was solid. <laughs> yeah. And I just realized that we have um, no less than two cult leaders in the podcast today. Yes. There's no hard feelings here between between cult leaders. No, oh, no, no, good. No. Do cults get along, or is it like uh, there's an actual battle between the gods? I think it depends on the cult. I was gonna say, uh, <laughs> Attack Squad has no. Uh, we have no qualms with Cult of Cat Meat. Um, we are forever at war with Dukes of Nuke because of the signs. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> sign war, the great sign war that started in 2014. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> just go. over it was the tower for a second and then it was the signs yeah yeah i think the sign evolved into the tower and yeah i think we won the tower war because we have a bell tower now yeah you guys are you're doing really good and we we're, we're over one as far as falling down 
Oh, oh man, called out. Stevie, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, in the uh, last Wastelanders story, when I had both the Baron and Mongo on, we had a very good discussion about the tower falling down, which um, we have decided is nobody's fault. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> okay, so Sharky, why don't you tell us the story you brought with you today? All right, so I got to set the stage a little bit here. Yeah. The year is 2019. Elinthris of Outpost 364, who was wearing masks before it was cool, was approached by a group calling themselves the Northern Trade Federation. Okay? These are newcomers to the Wasteland. They're they're older Wastelanders, but they're new to this lore play and getting involved in, in the, the big leagues or the Wasteland Famous Leagues, as we call it, right? Yeah. And they the barter game. And regrettably, they're a little bit self-aggrandizing. So... In correspondence, in less than courteous terms, they implied that not joining their group, uh, Elinthus and the Outpost not joining their group, would be a mistake. Elinthus declined. Outpost 364 is inarguably the biggest name in barter, trade, and mercantile business this side of the Rockies. And they earned that reputation by the tremendous merits of their labor. <laughs> trade now, um, so- Elinthus is with the Faceless Merchants. Can you tell us about their trade route? So their trade route, the trade route game, as they refer to it sometimes, is literally a trade route between many of the tribes and uh, hubs of commerce within Wasteland City and beyond. And if you go and join with them and sign up with them, uh, you'll be assigned that tra- a particular trade route to go along. And it's a great introductory um, means to like walk up to a camp as a representative of the Faceless Merchants and say, hey, I'm with the Faceless Merchants. You know, Do you have something to barter? Everyone who's agreed to have a trade contract with the outpost along that route will treat you as a, as a welcome friend and ally. You know, there's no, there's no hostility there because the faceless merchants name, just, just, just being part of or associated with that group means you already are on a level of like, Hey, we're not going to threaten you. We're not going to uh, do you wrong in trade deals. We're going to be honest and fair merchants, which is kind of a, a rare thing to find in the Mojave wasteland. So the Northern trade are basically competitors want to be competitors okay all right yeah all right continue from there upcoming upstarts yeah so they earned that reputation with the tremendous uh efforts of their labor like they they've worked hard the last couple of years to make sure that they are well established as the merchant tribe like the big name merchant tribe right there's plenty of others i don't want to do any disservice or disrespect to other merchant tribes but (laughs) the outpost is is like is the name right yeah Uh, and as such, they have trade contracts and business arrangements to consider. They have lots of allies to call upon if there's ever any trouble. And many of those allies will afford them protections and boons that not everyone is, you know, aware of. So this upstart Northern Trade Federation group, right, again, perhaps unaware of this uh, this arrangement, agrees to a meeting at the outpost to discuss the possibility of some manner of beneficial arrangement between them. Right? Okay. So now... To clarify, Terminal Island, our home base of operations, is fairly devoid of agricultural space. We trade some crude and refined fuels with the outpost for produce and luxury goods that aren't usually found in our yard containers. (laughs) So we, as security-minded individuals, agreed to attend the meeting to ensure our trade partners' well-being and the peaceful negotiations of the contract between Outpost 364 and the NTF. And since many of our forces that year were committed to the war against the Army of Los Angeles, shout out, by the way, to Crooked Fang and Scourge of the Revenant Maw, <laughs> I hired specifically the Autumn Pact to take point. If you haven't heard of them, the Autumn Pact is easily, easily the most capable, hands-on, attentive, and trustworthy band of mercenaries I've ever encountered in the wastes. Wait, have you heard of the Dukes of the Nuke? I've heard of the Dukes of the Nuke, and the Dukes of the Nuke <laughs> sold me <laughs> and paraded me around town in chains, so I'm, oh, not, I'm not plugging the Dukes of the Nuke. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like they might be slightly more capable, is all I'm saying. <laughs> I think that I didn't have the autumn packed with me. It, wouldn't, it would have been a very different story. Uh, okay, so you got the second best mercenary group in the Waste to help you out. <sighs> yes. <laughs> Wow! So I've got you. I've got you on tape now saying that. Uh, <laughs> so I instructed them to secure and bodyguard myself and my high-value target, our prisoner of war for that year, Princess Snickerdoodle of Texas. We needed them to escort us to and from the meeting. 
I should not have been surprised when they arrived, pulled up in front of my camp in an armored caravan. Nine yards, lead cloud, dog bite, scraps, and prost, all armed to the teeth and moving in formation, exited the vehicles and safeguarded myself and my high-value target. The princess was led quickly into the, radi- into the radiation raider. It's an armored van. Okay, so it's this heavily modified armored van, right? And she's placed under, uh, under heavy guard and, and secured away in there. Uh, I and the retinue with me loaded up into the gun truck, and the scout jeep ahead of us led the convoy away down the dusty streets of Wasteland City towards the outpost. We're rolling in style. <laughs> so we roll up to Gregor's Tower, which is the name of the outpost. And yeah. we arrange the vehicles in a defensive, like, half-moon perimeter before disembarking, right? And I don't have to do hardly anything here, because all the autumn pact disembarks and immediately fans out and tries to protect myself and the vehicle and the targets. And I signal my greetings and announce myself, but the guards at the outpost are already startled, because this convoy just, like, <laughs> just <laughs> rolled up on them and stopped and dumped out a bunch of people. And they're like, wait, what the... What the hell's yeah. going on, right? Let me say, Wastelanders can be very intimidating by themselves, but when you get a bunch of them and you put them in vehicles and they roll up on somewhere, you're you're never prepared for that. Yep. Yep. And I knew that the outpost was expecting us, but I don't think they were expecting what we brought. <laughs> so I ordered two of the pack to enter the outpost and check for hostile agents or saboteurs, because I've got the Army of LA, the Dukes of the Nuke, and the Wasteland Marshals on me. I mean, you can never be too careful when you have multiple targets on your back. It's real easy for someone to try and pull something. <laughs> so the princess and I get flanked by outpost and autumn pact guards, and we enter the tower and make our way up to the resplendent meeting chamber. I mean, this is, it's decorated with like pictures, with, with, with black canvas uh, oil paintings of Wasteland Elvis. So this place is top notch. You know, this is, this is a nice place. Oh, yeah. It's a swanky building. Oh, yeah. Very much so. So, once we get inside, we're greeted by Linthris and a Swedish lawyer representative named Mist. <laughs> Introductions are exchanged, and we get to discussing this great opportunity to demonstrate to new players, new new lore play players, the expansive world of Wasteland lore and its varied relationships at Mock Gunpoint. We went over the plan again, and I moved to stand at the side over where the balcony is to eagerly await our guests. As I look down, already below me, my hired mercs have fanned out to fill the gaps in this defensive perimeter, overwatching passersby and training their mounted guns on any vehicle that dared to approach. We began drawing the attention of nearby clusters of onlookers, and I ordered the pack to carefully watch for anyone that may be armed with grenades or satchel charges. I told them specifically to look out for Grim, and I told them specifically to look out for you. So I was thinking, <laughs> one of those sons of bitches is going to come by, and we're going to deny them entry. <laughs> I told them to challenge anyone who approached the tower and to state their business with those who are inside. So, a few minutes go by, start getting a little nervous. We're thinking like, oh, maybe they're trying to do some kind of clever ploy. I redeployed some of the pack to the rear of the outpost just in case anybody tried to do some sneaky, you know, enter through the back door kind of things. Eventually, a lone sandrail buggy putters slowly towards the tower. Its occupants worriedly draw their weapons, draw their weapons as some two dozen guns pointed suddenly in their direction. I order the autumn pack to approach and clear the vehicle and for its occupants to disembark. Four persons, some of whom I recognized, clear uh, four persons, some of whom I recognized, approached cautiously. I had them briefly mock frisked uh, for explosives, obviously. And in the spirit of mutual say again. For explosives. For explosives. I mean, explosives are, you know, very much anti-infantry. Like, you can see somebody drawing a gun, but you might not see somebody triggering explosives. So, <laughs> it's, it's important right. to be, you know, well, my goodness. I got I to gotta preserve me in mind. I got a high-value target with me. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. So, in the spirit of mutual respect, we allowed them to keep their guns, but we confiscated any, any grenades they had. So... They make their way inside, and the whole time, just oodles of guns are pointed at them. Right? They, they're this, you know, this mob scene. Uh, they enter the the they get they make their way up, and they enter the meeting room, and they're visibly intimidated. Like they're they're kind of shaking out of excitement and out of fear, but they're also grinning from ear to ear. So you can tell they're having a good time. <laughs> right? We welcome them. We introduce ourselves. We offer for them to sit. You know, obviously on the other side of this long boardroom table, that you know, very much intimidating. 
Uh, we encounter Not in Charge, a.k.a. Nick, and Spanky of the Northern Trade Federation, and their hired muscle, Doc Schofield and Digits. And we present them, or rather, Elanthrus presents them, with a lengthy trade contract. I'm talking multiple paragraphs, like legal paper filled to the brim with with gibberish, right? Uh, it's filled with unreasonable concessions, and it's written in faceless merchant glyph language. And she also presents them with a copy of um, the contract written in, of course, the only proper legal dialect in the wasteland, Swedish. Do you remember Hence, any of these unreasonable concessions? Oh, absolutely. Some of them were like, uh, you'll give to us 75% of your trade benefits and profits. <laughs> you'll uh, you'll agree to like pat your head and rub your tummy every Tuesday of the week kind of thing. <laughs> Perfect. It was it was it was pretty preposterous. Yeah, it was you know oh you'll you'll agree to uh you'll agree to um give to us like you know any crates of rubber duckies that you may find kind of thing just 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 <laughs> right. unreasonable and inconsequent like uh, totally uh, impossible impossible just to make sure the contract was unfair just to make sure the contract was unreasonably and exceedingly <laughs> unfair yes <laughs> yeah awesome so the NTF. Having seen all this, having walked past a veritable army of guns, having been frisked and having realized hmm, we're in way the hell over our heads, are very keen, very eager to sign. <laughs> very aware that the consequences of declining such a group that can bring such force to bear is perhaps worse than the terms and conditions. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point in time, they're like, okay, where do we sign, right? They're, they're, like, they're begging for the pen at this point. So we all bust up laughing, and we let them in on the joke. Ellen Thurst presents them with the English translation of the contract, which is rather more reasonable. And she points out the one clause in the contract that says, if you sign this contract, you're actually only agreeing to this clause, and the only other clauses don't exist. They're, they're, they're meaningless. And that was like, hey, let's have a mutual understanding. Let's have a mutually beneficial arrangement here at the Wasteland. Let's do trade, you know? Yeah. So, uh, one second, I have to find my spot back again. I know. I was like, I should have written a fucking script. Damn. <laughs> you wrote this out, didn't you? I want to make you sure wrote I, it out. I want to make sure I got the wording right. Well, there is a lot, and this is one of the more complicated stories I've heard so far. Me. Me. <laughs> it's just ye. <laughs> <laughs> ye. Yeah. So, Alanthus presents them with a, a more reasonable contract. They read over it. They agree to it. The Swedish lawyer signs off on it. Uh, the meeting ends amicably. And they are, again, at gunpoint, escorted back out of the building and back to their vehicle by the Autumn Pact. Uh, they, they make their merry way along, and all of us, you know, celebrate and high-five, and obviously an excellent and, uh, and beneficial arrangement. So when the meeting had finished, the Autumn Pact escorted myself and the princess back to the Petro Pirate Camp. I rewarded the mercs handsomely for their services and told them to expect my patronage again in the future. Again, highly recommend the Autumn Pact. If you're in need, if you're in need of somebody who actually knows what they're doing with a gun, hire so, them. So um, you can also hire the Dukes of the Nuke if you want it done right. If you want it done loudly and ten minutes late, yes. <laughs> actually, yes, that's part of our services. <laughs> <laughs> it's a feature, not a bug. <laughs> I so. In summary, I think that it is uh, best practice that whenever the opportunity presents itself and it's sensible and safe to do so, to include others in your role playing. I didn't have to include uh, uh, Princess Snickerdoodle. I didn't have to include the Autumn Pact. I could have just attended the meeting by myself and held a gun and waved around someone's face, right? But the yeah. idea was to involve others. So include others in your role playing, even if only tangentially so. Uh, I, it's an oxymoron, but I refer to it as inclusive exclusivity. <laughs> which is making events and activities have the, some of the trappings of clandestine goings on, but in practice, treat them like street theater. Treat them like, you're not welcome here, but secretly you really are because you can pick up on that. You know, Right. Allow attendees to participate at their own level of comfort and interest and reward those in the audience who follow the plot and get into character. And that's why. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sharky. Now... From you telling this story, I can tell you put in a lot of effort to make sure you get all the details right. This is obviously like incredibly complicated. There's a lot going on. Um, so thank you for you know telling this story and making sure everything was told so we could understand it. And I feel like that's exactly how you do how you deal with these shenanigans at Wasteland. Is things are really well thought out and organized. Is am I right there, or, or is this just completely off the cuff? 
I would say prior to the event, it is 80% planning and 20% will wing it. Then when you get to the event, it is very much the inverse. <laughs> yeah, that makes Your a lot plans of sense. go right out the window. But the problem with the difficulty with that is like, okay, take what you can of your plans and make the best of it. Try to include people when you can. Try to include, you know, somebody yeah. getting grabbed and carried off or exiled or whatever. Like, okay, that's that's the mo now. We're gonna we're gonna roll with it. We're gonna figure this out. Right. Yeah. And it's so fun when this stuff kind of happens and you don't know it's happening, but you just happen to be there. That can be a lot of fun and. And a, a lot of like general wastelanders can just happen to be walking by and happen to see it. You know, it's not like Disneyland where you can just come back in an hour and see the same yep. show if you missed it. This stuff is happening organically in real time. And this kind of, I don't want to say politics, but this kind of relationships between the tribes, they happen over the course of the weekend. So they'll start on Wednesday when the event starts and then go all the way to Saturday night as the event's coming to a close. And it's linear. It happens once and it becomes this kind of an organic entertainment that is just so fun it is it really is we also encourage active participation if you're respectful and aware of what's going on and what may be the plan like if you if you can be yes and about it then yeah. you're welcome to join yeah yeah and one thing i noticed kind of early on is tribe leaders would kind of discuss all right so hey i'm gonna bring my tribe over we're gonna attack we're gonna try to steal your relic or something like that yeah and they'll form a loose plan and then they take the lead when everyone shows up so the people that know the plan take the lead and the rest of the tribe can just yes and they support you know if the leader raises his gun the rest of the tribe raises their gun if the leader puts their gun down the rest of the tribe puts their gun down so you have this like viral um size limit to the theater because you only need two people who you only need two people who know what's happening or, you, with the Dukes and Nuke, you put your gun up and they all put their <laughs> gun up and you put your gun down and they all keep their guns up <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's another one of our services <laughs> yeah oh and one other thing i wanted to talk about too was the swedish lawyer and how all viable contracts need to be written in swedish i actually don't know but i've heard about this but i don't know where that came from can you tell us a little bit about that well if you ever end up in wasteland court uh which you know you might get wasteland court marshaled honestly if you're doing wasteland right you'll do something wrong you get court marshaled for it oh totally uh, you need to be able to either propose uh, a business arrangement with a swedish lawyer or know a swedish lawyer or speak swedish yourself so <laughs> swedish has been has been recognized as the as the official lore play like legal jargon and contract of things and where does I, this come from do you happen to know any swedes uh i happen to know several swedes i am good friends with a number of swedes <laughs> and uh very much so because most of what I consider my wasteland career is very much illegal. I mean, stealing from people, arson, blackmailing, that kind of thing. I'm like, yeah, I need a legal defense every once in a while. <laughs> of course. And we mentioned in the last Wastelander stories, the w the WCC, the Wasteland Communication Corps, they've got several different Swedes in their tribe. Not only do they do the Wasteland Radio, they do the Wastelander newspaper, which is printed every day on site. They do shortwave radio communications out into the real world throughout the event. And what else? They're working on Wastelander TV, which is pretty wild. But somewhere along the line, they became the lawyers of Wasteland as well, which I think they just decided that themselves. <laughs> they kind of got swept up into it, yeah. Yeah. But it's nice to have somebody who's out there who is... I don't want to say neutral, but like uh, less bribable than others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are a very neutral tribe. They're kind of like the United States Post Office if it was post-apocalyptic. So they have to remain fairly yeah. neutral. Yeah, they have to deliver all the mail bombs. <laughs> <laughs> well, they do. And in the last Wastelander stories, again, we uh, did hear a story about where they were more than happy to deliver a cap bomb to Legio 1. Legio I? Legio one uh, it doesn't matter <laughs> uh, so you know they might not be completely neutral but they will deliver every package <laughs> okay well thanks so much for that story that was a lot of fun thank you and i wish i could have been there for that one darn it we'll invite you next, <laughs> next one. time okay so it's really cool because in wasteland city it's really cool because in Wasteland City, there's a lot of improv happening all the time. People go in and out of character and entire scenes are performed on the spot. With all that spontaneity happening, there's bound to be some mistakes, some 
downright casualties of lore. Our next story is from the false prophet who takes the calamity cake. And we're about to hear all about it <laughs> right after this word from the Cult of Cat Meat, improvised right now by Grotch. Howdy, everyone. We all know that within the hardened shells of our dust-covered armor, there's a small shriveled heart there somewhere. Well, if you need to feel alive again, nothing will warm your tiny black heart like donating to a good cause. Not only will you get cool swag or pictures of bodacious babes, but you get to help us out. All purchases, or should I say purchases, from the Cult of Cat Meat section <coughs> of Gamma Grotch's shop shop on Etsy goes 100% towards meows, or medical emergencies of wasteland sidekicks. <laughs> well done. Did you write that during our downtime? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that was the I'm best very one, proficient at multitasking, okay? <laughs> That's why you were so quiet during that last story. You were over there typing. <laughs> hey, at least I wasn't typing on my keyboard, okay? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, Tim, you're up. Okay, so um, talking about things going wrong, a uh, little bit little bit of improvising, but also uh, real anger? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, well, okay, so for a little bit of context, there, there's an ongoing joke that the false prophet is a gift from the Baron. And that's because the Baron is my best friend and um, he gives me a lot of gifts and it just kind of evolved into the joke because a lot of my costume pieces, a lot of my wasteland weapons were gifts from either the Baron or the Skullduggers. Um, and it's one of those things where I, I've always been focused on more of the construction side of things or, um, you know, building, you know, vehicles or designing the camp and stuff like that to where once wasteland rolls around and it's build crew, I don't have anything to wear. Uh, so like, the Baron gave me this old armor plated chest thing that he used to wear. And I scavenged some of those pieces. Um, they gave me a fully functional non-firing replica of the sawed off sh shotgun from uh, Mad Max. Right. Dope. Awesome. Um, uh, they've given me uh, staffs and uh, melee weapons and, uh, you know, all sorts of costume items and, you know, just gifts and stuff. Cause um, I, I think somebody could probably correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the attack squad skulldugger, uh, joint ventureship, um, you know, alliance is one of the oldest in the wasteland, if not the oldest. I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, that's Since they're probably right. I'd say, yeah, um, almost certainly, that's probably right. Like that's, yeah, it's pretty close. But um, so, anyways, uh, one thing that my tribe is really good at is like, yeah, we're a cult. We kind of do the spooky cult thing. But really what our tribe ends up being is just the after party because we're directly across from the stage <laughs> right next door to the Atomic Cafe. So we just end up being fucking party central. Yeah. And um, what ends up, so another thing we're actually really good at is hiring people to do jobs. So Mickey Bang Bang, leader of the Skullduggers, hires four of my guys uh, for a job. And it was uh, Giggs. He's uh, one of our guys from, uh, he was in Florida. He's National Guard, no, uh, Coast Guard. Uh, he's Coast Guard and uh, uh, who, oh my goodness, who else was there? Uh, Giggs, uh, Foggyosa, um, who also, <laughs> that's a great name. <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, Eric Fogg. He's, he's also done a whole bunch of work for the post office and for the, the Rust Devils bounty hunting game. Okay. Um, uh, my brother Joe Fish was there and uh, Sir Buttercup, one of the Knights of Undertown. Oh, wow. So these aren't just like brand new wastelanders. These are wastelanders who have been in the game for years. And we have a really good standing relationship with the Skullduggers. So Mickey bang, bang hires them and says, Hey, I will pay you guys X amount of dollars. I don't remember what the amount was. Cause I was so uh -huh. blind, blinding angry. And he says, <laughs> I need you guys to go across the street to uh, the Dukes of the nuke camp and steal that gun. That's on top of their tower. So I think that like <laughs> three of the four of them sat on each other's shoulders to reach up and get it and then ran across the street, three people tall and they fell over at some point. Um, the Dukes caught wind just as they were ducking into the mushroom cloud lounge and they jumped <laughs> this gun right at Bang's feet. And they go, okay, quick pay us because they're coming in the door right now. <laughs> <laughs> Two kids in a trench coat running with a gun. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, Mickey Bang Bang goes, you just go around the back. I'll pay you when, when you, when they, when, when the coast is clear. So they go running through the back of the mushroom cloud lounge to safety. The Dukes come in, they exchange some words, they get their gun back and they leave. My guys come, they come back in the front door about 10 minutes later, they're just, you know, strutting hot shit, ready to collect their payment. And they go, Hey, um, we're here to collect payment. And Mickey goes for what? 
and they were like, oh, for, for that job that we just did, you know, you know, the one where you wanted us to get a gun and we brought it to you. And he goes, I don't see a gun. Oh God. Yeah. So, so, so then <laughs> cut to the attack squad camp. I'm sitting on the throne and we're, I think we were right in the middle of doing story time with the false prophet where I tell many of these stories. Uh huh. And these three guys walk up and they're just like, Hey, um, the skull duggers didn't pay us for our job. And it's just like <laughs> a record scratch heard across wasteland city. And I was like, um, tell me one more fucking time. What happened? So they tell me what happened. And immediately I'm just like angry. And I'm, I'm like, <laughs> not even in a ha ha. Let's go have a conversation. I'm pissed. So I go straight to my, I go straight into my trailer and I grab every single gift from the skull duggers. Whoa. I put on, I put on my armor. I put on my shoulder pads. I grab my weapon. I grab the belt that they gave me. I grab the helmet <laughs> that the Baron g- gifted to me. The special I grab underpants. The, yeah, the special <laughs> underpants. I grab, the uh, I grab the melee weapon that's based on either South American or African melee weapons where there's a face on it. It turns out they popped up at the same exact time, like 4,000 years ago, and they can't decide who came up with it first. Oh, wow. It's a really cool melee weapon, right? And I go over there just like dressed to the nines and my guys are like oh man tim's getting dressed to like lay down the law right so i, I go over there full false prophet regalia and i'm i'm just yeah. I'm, I'm ready and the closer i'm getting to the mushroom cloud lounge the angrier i'm getting <laughs> <laughs> and you gotta walk like right down main street to get yeah. there I mean, so there's only one camp in between us, but it's definitely just, you know, strutting down Main Street. I got my four yeah. guys behind me, right? <laughs> and, That's the high walk. walk. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, walk, I walk into the Mushroom Cloud Lounge and there's Mickey Bang Bang sitting on the throne and he's got his feet kicked up just like I was about 15 minutes ago, having a great time. And uh, next to him is the Baron and they're having what looks like a serious conversation, but I have zero fucks to give about any of their conversations at this point. So I walk in and I stand there and I wait about three or four seconds and they don't look up and acknowledge me. And I take off my <laughs> and I go, Mickey. And he turns to me. He's like, Hey, I need a minute. And I go, you mother. Fucker. <laughs> he goes, uh, uh, j- you just give me a minute. And I was like, no, you don't get a minute. You get this right now. And I take <laughs> off my shoulder and I throw them onto the ground. And like, they're full of like metal, like armor plating. So it's all clanky and there's chains on it. So I am making noise. Yeah. And I take off best and i slam it onto the ground and all the all of the rings hanging off the chains on it the baron acquired while he was the leader (laughs) he was the president of a biker gang in japan and he put all these rings on this armor for me it's like it's a super sweet gift now it's in the dirt it's in the dirt and i don't care (laughs) Take, take my belt off throw it in the dirt take my gun out of its holster, throw the gun on the pile and I'm piling everything up. And they're like, Whoa, 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 what's wrong? What's wrong? I'm like, I'm not done. And I grab staff and I throw the staff on the ground and I go, you know, hang on, let's see. This was 2019. So I'm like, okay, okay. seven, I think it was seven years. So I go seven years. One of the longest, um, uh, uh, um, what did I, what did I call it earlier? Damn it. I'm forgetting the word. Alliances. One of the alliances. I go, yes, seven years one of the longest alliances in Wasteland City, potentially the history of all of Wasteland. And you're going to fuck my guys over like that. And Mickey is not in character. He's not playing along. He's like, whoa, 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 Tim, 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 hang on. Just hang on one sec. And, I'm like, <laughs> and like, my guys are starting to take steps back because like I'm swinging my arms around. I'm not trying to hit him. I'm just making this. Gr- I'm bloviating like a motherfucker. <laughs> my arms are flying out to the side. <laughs> and I'm like, you're going to hire my guys to do a job for you. You fucking pay them. And they're like, no, no, Tim, Tim, you don't understand. You need to calm down right now. I was like, I don't give a fuck what you need. My guys need to get paid. We've been friends for years. And like, at this point, everybody in the Mushroom Cloud Lounge is staring at me. And I throw the last down, which is the, you know, the helmet or whatever. It's a big crank. And I was like, take your gifts and don't ever step foot in my camp again. Whoa. <laughs> and and the, the Baron walks up. He's like, hey, hey, Tim, we're, we're dealing with a security situation right now. And I go, oh. And I look off to the side. And there's, t- <laughs> there's <laughs> these two Wasteland security volunteers that are interviewing somebody <laughs> for like, their version of a story and it's a really serious thing that happened i cannot say what happened oh my god (laughs) i had been been filled in on what was going on i didn't know that inside the skull duggers camp was where they were kind of having to deal with some of this stuff and i was just like oh (laughs) hey hey uh sorry guys the the two security guys just looked at me and they're just like okay (laughs) And and i turned back to mickey and he goes 
And he goes, he goes, we'll pay you, we'll pay your guys. We, we, we just kind of need to clean this up. And I immediately snapped back into angry false profit, profit mode. I was like, not only are you going to pay my guys, but you're going to bring all my shit back to me after you do. And I walked out. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm just sitting in my throne now naked without any of my stuff. I was like, damn it. I should make my own damn costumes. <laughs> and then here comes the Baron and Mickey. They're like, Hey dude, we're sorry. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I kind of got in the middle of your guys' you know, security thing going on at, I didn't mean to, but also Mickey, fuck you, pay my guys. He's like, sorry, I, I thought it'd be funny. I was like, no, pay my guys, you dick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so uh, not only did they get paid, but I think Mickey gifted them like weapons and some armor and stuff, and like awesome. he, he made a big deal out of it. So it, it it turned out to be good. But yeah, I was ready to just like throw down with my best friend. Oh my god, <laughs> I I wonder like what that security thing, like if that security thing wasn't happening, then how would that have gone down? Have you given that any thought? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I feel like they would have been able to play along. It probably would have been resolved a lot faster. Um, <laughs> we're on the same page. Um, I forgot. I don't know the reason why Mickey didn't pay them. Like we never really got into those details or anything. But um, yeah, but, like it would it would have been resolved. I probably wouldn't have had to strip everything off either. Um, I, I can also imagine. I found I found out later that once the security was done, like with, with like their questioning or their investigation, you know, whatever yeah. was going on. Uh, they went up to Mickey and the bear and they're like, Hey, uh, do we need to go talk to that guy? Is everything okay? <laughs> <laughs> they're like, no, 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 no. We're just playing make believe. And they're like, are you sure? Cause he was really angry. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> like, uh, we're, just, we're just playing in wasteland. We're best friends. I promise. He's a performer. He's very convincing. <laughs> See now I like you very rarely get the chance to actually play at wasteland. Yeah. Like, I'm so busy the whole time because usually I'm running around with the camera just trying to capture everything and interview people and all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, so when I do get to play, I I either, one, have no confidence in what I'm doing, or two, take it way too far. <laughs> Does this have anything to do with that one time where we're running down Main Street holding a cow and we ran by your camp and you were like, Duke! I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, I'm playing. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh, good God. Yeah, that was. Um, so let's see. We were doing the staff meeting at the end of uh, the, the late Saturday night when everything was closing. Yeah, down. Saturday night, at like two or three a.m. Usually when things are kind of quieting down. It's the last night of Wasteland. We, we always do staff. Yeah. Meeting. So so Adam and Jared were running this thing and we're talking about how everything went down. And at the end of the meeting. Adam's like, so, hey, um, does anyone want to go um, steal a cow? <laughs> I don't think a single person said no. Yeah, I'm pretty sure a vast majority. I don't think Jared came, but yeah, a vast majority of everyone else was like, I yes, am. we are in on this mission. Allegedly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it wasn't any of us, really. Uh, none of us uh, stole a cow. And I, I think the way that Junktown got distracted was because we had so many people. We just sent everybody inside to start a party. They're like, yeah, fucking party. And then like 10 of us grabbed the cow. <laughs> <laughs> and it was chained. The cow was chained, but it was chained yeah. in a weird way that all we had to do was twist it off or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't have a lock, but they wanted it to look like it was changed. So somebody went over to mess with it, and the whole thing just like fell apart. And they're like, "Grab it, run quick!" Yeah, wow. and they had told other people somewhere along the line that like this is someone's special actual cow that they didn't want to get damaged. <laughs> and here we are, all drunk on two a.m. on Saturday night, running yeah. down the street, four or five of us each holding a leg or a tail. <laughs> yeah, or the other door. Yeah. Oh man, and we we made it. We ran by the Dukes of the Nuke, and the Dukes are always trying to get me to play because we don't get to play. They they're always like, we don't get to play with you. We don't get, we do all these dookie things, and you're never there. And uh, they don't ever realize that I'm actually just in the background uh, while they're playing. But I'm always trying to like, when I'm actually gonna wasteland as a verb, <laughs> I'm always like, guys, I'm doing it. Look at me. Guys, I did it. <laughs> so we're running by the Duke's camp with this cow, like over our shoulders. And I look under the udder of the cow and I see the Dukes are out there and I'm like, Dukes, <laughs> and we're doing it. <laughs> and they all look up and all they see is this, this full size, dark shadowy cow figurine running down main street. <laughs> I think that was the night we put, uh, we put Queen Labifa on the safety pole and the dance platform at the Atomic Cafe. Yeah. <laughs> and the safety pole is not a, it, well, it, it is a safety pole, but it's not a safety pole. No. <laughs> did, did Queen Labifa have the, the dildo strapped onto her head by then or no? 
Uh, I think someone else did that like overnight. Okay. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good time. That was one of those instances of, I went from not playing at all to grand theft larceny. (laughs) (laughs) Grand theft lactate. (laughs) (laughs) Lactate. (laughs) Lactosony. Oh man. Uh, Okay. Good times. (laughs) <laughs> and you may ask yourself, why was the cow chained? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, yeah. I think the Junktown folk have said that they might still be br- they might still be bringing it out and stuff, but um, uh, it, it it is getting a little damaged with all the shenanigans. And the owner of the cow <laughs> is super cool with it. They love they love all of the shenanigans, but they also don't want their cow broken. So I think they might be bringing it out again, but for real, chaining it up and for real, putting a sign saying this thing's gonna break. Please don't take it. <laughs> no yeah. more helicopter rides. And yeah. that was what, 2018. So that was the, the year before the helicopter became a thing. Oh, yeah. Okay. 2019 was the helicopter. Yeah. So it was one up to, in like such a massive way. Someone brought out this helicopter. Yeah. Now it was actually, you know, it was a stripped down helicopter. It was like a junkyard yeah, helicopter. Just a you know, it didn't have the blades or anything still on it. It was just the shell. Uh, that's not true. They put what? a ceiling fan on top of it, so it had. <laughs> That's a perfect. Yeah, thank thanks. <laughs> the ceiling fan looked ridiculous. It's it was hilarious. like this 1981 circa five blade ceiling fan that looks like it was in a little kid's room or something. Yeah, it looks like they stole it from their local DMV or something. That's how old it is. Yeah, <laughs> but. It was out in front of someone's camp as post-apocalyptic decoration, but I don't think they wanted to take it back home or something like that. So word got around and entire tribes started going over. And if you've got five or six guys with any decent strength, you could just pick it right up and move it. So it ended up going all over Wasteland over the course of the week. Yeah, I think at some point Adam and or Jared made the request to like, put the helicopter ceiling on hold for a little bit. I feel like they were maybe getting ready for um, the car show or something. There was going to be a lot of traffic. <laughs> so like, guys, can you just not? And we're like, yeah, okay, cool. So we told our camp, we're like, hey guys, uh, if you're involved in the helicopter stuff, just, you know, hold off on it for a little bit. And then one of our guys, Buttercup, Sir, Sir Buttercup, Knight of Undertown, comes <laughs> running up and says, hey guys, I'm going to go get the helicopter. And Ra- <laughs> Rachel in our camp goes, no or not and she's terrifying and uh uh-huh. he just goes oh uh okay and about three seconds later he's still standing there looking as white as a sheet i mean covered in dirt because wasteland and here comes the helicopter because he paid another <laughs> tribe to take it <laughs> <laughs> and another another gal in our tribe morgan she's riding on top of it and they drop the helicopter in front of us and i look at rachel and rachel looks pissed because now we're the ones who are staff and have been telling people stop moving the helicopter and now it's sitting in front of my <laughs> We're like, uh, and Morgan's on the helicopter and she goes, false prophet. I've brought you a gift. <laughs> like, no. Oh God. That's good. Behold, Perfect. The evidence of your crime. <laughs> <laughs> Get down from there right now. <laughs> oh my that and that that helicopter ended up on what like a farlander's car during one of the vehicle cruises yeah it was it was making its way around and it was at the front gate um they closed the front gate of wasteland city at night because no cars allowed in the city at night uh, once the sun goes down and they actually used that to block traffic one yeah. night and it was just a perfect little art piece yeah usually they use adam's truck but it was it was quite pleasing to walk out of the den one night to go home or i guess one morning if we're being honest and there's the heckle yeah i'm like god damn it you guys <laughs> yeah and they even brought it up to dave dufour's house for his birthday and like left it there for a few days what a, a truly wastelander present that's right it, out at, at his his real home not wasteland yeah that's yeah, right his that. real home so <laughs> yeah. it carries the stuff carries out into the real world Happy birthday, Dave. So Morgan. funny. <laughs> Where's that subscription service? Can I can I sign up to have cows and helicopters delivered to my front yard? <laughs> you could hire the Dukes to do it if you weren't such a dick about it. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, the blood feud's over. We're good. We're good. <laughs> I understand that the uh, Skullduggers, amongst a few other tribes, are trying to n- be not such bad guys anymore. Is that a thing? Is that true? Is that going on in Wonder- Undertown? Since we have two Undertown representatives here in the room. Uh, I'd say no. <laughs> Maybe what you're picking up on is the 
the opening of Undertown to the, the leeway of like, hey, there's other bad guy groups in the Waste and they can do their own thing. We don't have to be the best at it. <laughs> oh, I see. You guys are equal opportunity enjoyment. Yes. Yeah. Equal opportunity plunderers. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. So maybe that's what I'm catching wind of. Listen, Jabba the Hunt had all kinds of people in this palace. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good point. All right. So, well, guys, um, I think we're about ready to wrap things up. Anyone else have any fun things to throw in? I'm looking forward to the safe and sane return of Wasteland events, whatever year that may end up being. Yeah, so true. I mean, as soon as I can get the vaccine just slammed right into my veins, I'll, I'll be ready. <laughs> exactly. Same here. All right. Well, thank you guys all so much for coming to tell your tales today. All yeah. three of you have been an amazing part and a great inspiration to Wasteland. You guys are so active in not just the lore, but also the community and keeping Wasteland going throughout the year. So thank you all so much for doing that. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for, yeah, having absolutely. Us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. All right, guys. This has been another edition of Wastelander Stories on the Apocalypse Postcast, a podcast. Please subscribe to the show wherever you're listening. And if you have a funny or amazing Wastelander story to tell and you want to come on the show, send an email with the short version of your story to theapocpost at gmail.com. That's T-H-E-A-P-O-C-P-O-S-T at gmail.com. We're just getting this whole podcasting thing started. So if you enjoyed the show, share it with your friends. And if you hated it, share it with your enemies. And I'll see you next time, survivors. Stay alive. Hey, Survivors, if you want to help support The Apocalypse Post and get some rad merch in exchange, head over to theapocalypsepost.square.site, where you can pick up some patches, postcards, or our newest edition, a set of guitar picks. Or get yourself a limited edition Apocabob pin. This little man is showing the world that all it takes to survive the end times is a gas mask and a dream of, well, just staying alive.